Welcome back, everybody. Monday, February 20th. This is today's Ukraine update. Today, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about Biden's visit to Ukraine. It's a surprise visit today. I am John Arbosis. This is the Arbosis Report. Uh, let me get TikTok rolling. And as usual, we will wait maybe two minutes for folks to arrive, and then we'll get rolling. So there you go. All right. And because the sun, the light is getting longer through the day, the light's now coming in my window when I start the show, so I get to be orange. <laughs> Pretty soon we have to start shutting the curtains for the show for the next eight months. It's been nice to have them open, but you know, only so, so much we can do with the lighting. Anyway, um, and I see uh, Carlos Bolton has a question uh, as we're waiting for folks to join us here. Uh, Carlos was saying, have you heard of a pundit by the name of Timothy Snyder? He's an amazing political understanding of Ukraine, Russia, and the U.S. No, uh, not at all, but there we go. Share it with everybody. Um, I have no idea who he is, though. So, ooh, this is kind of scary looking. So TikTok went live, but there's literally nobody there. <laughs> oh, TikTok, why do you do these things to me? TikTok! Oh, God. All right, let me shut. You know what? I'm wondering if it went. Hold on. Let's close this again. I'm not sure what TikTok's doing here. Hang on, guys. One second here, all right? Live, not subscription only, all right. Still live, let's see what happens. That was kind of weird. Kicked out, oh, Mike. Hello. I'm being forgetting my mic again. You know how that goes. Sorry, guys. All right, let's wait two minutes here. My mic, well, my mic's on, but of course it was, you know, three feet above me, so that probably didn't help very much. There's the TikTokers, all right. This is better this time. All right. The TikTokers are flowing in. All right. In any case, Carlos, I was telling you, uh, I do not know who that is. Carlos was asking uh, about a political uh, pundit named Timothy Snyder, who he said is very good, but I do not know who that is. So now folks know. Yeah, I had, sorry. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had my mic like three feet over my head and my mic is an excellent mic. I bought a really nice mic on purpose, but the funny thing it does is if you don't have it in front of your face, it picks nothing up because the idea of the mic is so that you don't pick up noise around you. So you don't get the echo in my room. You don't get, you know, construction, but it's not a great idea to have it three feet over your head. Anyway, I was saying that uh, we'll wait about a minute or two for folks to join us on TikTok and YouTube and everywhere else. And then I will kick in. So let's, like I said, we can maybe introduce yourselves as you guys always do say where you're from. And then we will discuss Biden's trip to Ukraine today. Very exciting. Very exciting. <clears throat> yep. Get ready for whack a troll on TikTok. Copies. How are you? Kelvin from Nigeria. Hey, Kelvin. I we we don't get enough Africans on this show. I don't know. I don't know if it's the timing or what it is, but nice to see you. Or, or people in Africa, I should say. I won't assume you're African, but nonetheless, welcome. Anyway, all right, guys. I think I'm ready to kick in here. Um, so welcome again. Thank you, Tattooed. Um, welcome here. I am John Aravosis. This is the Aravosis Report. Uh, this is my nightly show where we talk about the latest news from Ukraine. Uh, the way it works is I talk about half an hour about the latest news, and then we switch to q and I'm going to adjust my screen just a little bit on TikTok if it doesn't take a dive on me. And then we switch to Q&A where you guys get to ask your questions. On TikTok, use the Q&A link that is in my profile. That's the easiest way to do it for me because then they line up in a row. On YouTube, use the box at the bottom. And I do do this full time and I do it for free. I've been doing it since the war broke out. The only income I take is from you guys. So I very much appreciate your gifts on TikTok, your gifts on YouTube, the super chat, super stickers. Um, and I will always do a shout out when I see them on, on TikTok. And I will always uh, prioritize your questions on YouTube that are super chat. Thank you for that. All right, guys, let's get rolling. So the really big news today, very exciting. Yes, I'll talk about my sweatshirt in a second. In honor of today's news, I am wearing my official Zelensky sweatshirt. These are the actual Zelensky sweatshirts, the ones he wears everywhere. I, we got to the company in Ukraine, bought the sweatshirt. This is it. Um, very exciting. But we auction these, I'm auctioning these off on my Discord. We can talk about that later. But it's discord.erovosis.com. But I had a bunch of them shipped from Ukraine, so we're auctioning them off. 
but very exciting. Yeah, they're my, my Zelensky shirt. We just got these like three days ago. All right. So the news, Biden, President Biden went to Ukraine today. Big deal. Big. De and I don't say big deal as in big deal. I mean, big deal. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, for that. Um, President Biden flew to Ukraine. Uh, very few people knew it was actually kept a secret in his administration. Very few journalists knew. Thank you, Soren. Um, very few journalists knew about it. Uh, the Americans did notify the Russians a couple hours before Biden took off, I believe, from here in the States. Um, the idea being you don't want the Russians to accidentally blow him up um, and, you know, by shooting at, at, at Kiev, et cetera. Uh, it's funny. Some people, I forget, um, we talked about this before, and I remember some people saying, isn't it a risk warning the Russians of these things? Not really, because in the end, the Russians aren't going to kill Biden. I mean, literally, it's World War III. It is literal World War III. If they kill President Biden, we are at war with Russia. Russia doesn't want that. I mean, Russia is not happy with us, but they're not doing well fighting Ukraine. They really don't need to fight America, too. Um, so we notified the Russians. They made a point of not bombing him. One stupid thing the Russians did, which was actually hilarious because it helped Biden out immensely, a Russian uh, MiG fighter, uh, fighter jet took off in Belarus, and again, handy dandy map. Here's Ukraine. Here's Kiev, the capital. Belarus is right here. Uh, Russia's right here. Belarus is a dictatorial ally of Russia, and there have been a lot of attacks from Ukraine from Belarus. Well, a MiG fighter jet takes off in Belarus right when Biden is standing there with Zelensky, like in the plaza. Kiev is right here. Um, a missile fired from Belarus, they said, from a uh, from a MiG fighter jet, would take about 20 minutes to hit Kiev. So the air raid sirens went off, and literally, you've got this video of Zelensky and Biden, you know, walking together, talking with this beautiful historic church behind them, and you hear the air raid sirens go off, meaning the the Russians are attacking. I mean, it symbolically. The, the vision of it. And of course, both, both somebody who's writing badasses, exactly. Both presidents, of course, don't respond. I mean, like you're watching it, hearing the air raid sirens go off and Zelensky and Biden aren't even paying attention. But as somebody who, uh, one of the things I always, well, there's a lot of different lessons I try to bring up about politics. I've worked in politics in Washington for over 30 years. And I always talk about marketing and how marketing matters in politics. You've got to sell your ideas. You can't just assume ideas will sell themselves. This is something, by the way, I often say Republicans understand and Democrats don't, at least in terms of American politics. Republicans understand that it's all about messaging. Democrats think, we've got a good idea. It'll sell itself. And it's like, no, good ideas don't sell themselves. <laughs> You've got to sell every idea. In any case, so the idea of Biden walking with Zelensky and air raid sirens going off is something you couldn't produce in Hollywood. I mean, anyway. It, it, it added to the sort of the whole ethos or pathos, whatever the word is of the moment. Now, um, more. The, the trip is being compared, interestingly, very good response overall to the trip. Um, it's being compared in the media to uh, President Reagan's trip to Berlin. Remember, I want to say 1986, but I'm not, was it 87? When was it? What year was it when Reagan, 87? When Reagan went to Berlin, West Berlin, stood before the wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You know, very iconic moment, very moving moment. And it's something we remember now what, 40, 35 years later, right? Um, folks, gonna somebody's going to Google and tell us what year that was that Reagan did that. Thank you for the hat there, killers. Um, the other one, obviously, is John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, 80, I think it's 87 or so, John F. Kennedy going to Berlin as well. Ironic that both of them are Berlin. Uh, way earlier during the, um, the Berlin crisis, oh God, when would... God, when was the Berlin crisis? Are we talking, are we talking 61? I'm trying to remember exactly. In any case, Kennedy went and gave the Ich bin ein Berliner speech. Remember that one? Um, so a lot, anyway, this is good overall. And I mean, I'm not even, forget Biden and politics. I don't even, I don't even care about that tonight. 1961, okay. I don't even care about that. In terms of how this affects Biden in the elections, I don't care. Um, I've been saying for a long time, I have been very critical of Biden for not going to Ukraine. Um, the All the top, pretty much, I mean, I'm trying to think of, did maybe Schultz didn't go, but the German president went, I think. I'm not sure if Schultz even went, but most of the top allies of Ukraine have been to Ukraine. Uh, Boris Johnson, the British president, you couldn't get rid of the British prime minister, you couldn't get rid of. 
Johnson, Johnson, Johnson's been there like, you know, more than I visit my mother in a year. Um, but Biden had has not been. And we had not had senior American officials there either. And this trip, there was some talk about somebody going. And we thought maybe, maybe, and I, I had said actually the other day, I don't know if, I think it was with you guys, maybe I had said the other day that at the very least, it has to be Kamala Harris. It cannot be just the secretary of state. I said, Biden would be great, but I don't believe it. Biden showed up. Biden showed up. Now, uh, a number of things, or one of the other big things people are saying is rather historic and interesting is that um, Biden went here, it basically went to a war zone. In the past, American presidents have gone to war zones. Uh, a lot of them, God, I think it probably Trump, Obama, Bush have all gone to, thank you, Nepas, um, have gone to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, a number of those presidents. But we have never gone to a war zone before a president when American troops, A, were not in the country. We don't have troops in Ukraine. And therefore, our troops have not provided a secure security situation in the country. Biden had to rely exclusively on Ukrainian troops for security once he's there. Now, of course, he brought the Secret Service. But as far as who's protecting the airspace, who's protecting everything, it's it's the Ukrainians. Um, that's also very interesting to me because that's a real vote of confidence, I think, for the Ukrainians. I, I really mean that because what, what I was going to get to next here is I think this trip shows a real shift in thinking for Biden, which is very interesting. Thank you, Messi, for that. Um, Biden, over the last year, one of the things I've been very critical of Biden. Now, I will say first, um, I think Biden, you know, uh, uh, God, what's his name? I really like him at the Washington Post. I met him once a while ago. Um, ah, Indian American uh, opinion writer, like Ishtar. It's not Ishtar. Uh, um, oh, God, I'm forgetting his name. Ood, something. Anyway, a very good writer, but he wrote a piece today saying that Biden is basically still the leader of Europe and talking about how, you know, in, in even today, the American president is basically taking the lead and pulling the Europeans together. Um, what has been annoying for me, and I say that as a, I praise Biden for that. What has been annoying to me is, um, oh, and Elise, I'll bring yours up in a second, has been, I feel like from the beginning, Biden has been helping Ukraine, but we've been slowly, 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 slowly giving more and more. We're giving a lot, but this is a thing too. I think there's a fallacy out there. You will see, especially either either critics of helping Ukraine will say this, right? The people who are either pro-Putin or hate Ukraine or whatever, or or you'll see this from kind of the left, uh, the lefty Biden lovers, right? Who say, we've given so much money. What do you mean Biden hasn't done enough? And they, they make the mistake. Let me put it this way. Imagine you've got cancer and your doctor says, we've spent $100,000 on you. And you sort of say, that's nice, but you didn't give me the right medicine. Biden has been slowly giving medicine. We keep giving better and better medicine as each month goes on, but we still aren't quite giving them the medicine they need, right? We're not giving them the long range missiles that they need. We're giving them first, we're giving them very short range missiles, then missiles that go 60 miles. Now we're about to give them, we promised, missiles that can go 100 miles, 150 kilometers. The Ukrainians need missiles that go 200 miles or 300 kilometers. They're not getting it. Tanks. We took forever to give them tanks. Finally, only a couple of weeks ago, we finally decided to give them tanks. And now it's going to take months, if not years, to get them the damn tanks, right? I mean, to get them the majority of the tanks. We're doing the same thing on fighter jets now. We're going to sit here and we're going to hash out fighter jets. Thank you, David. And then finally, when we decide to give them fighter jets, we're going to say, well, it's going to take a year to actually find the jets and then another six months to train you. And it's it's on. And th th that is my criticism of Biden. And I think to take it back here now, this trip, and I uh, think so. I do have your questions, Elise and uh, Eva, but I want to sort of keep going with this a minute. This trip to me is an indication that Biden's thinking is moving in the right direction. Up until now, up until recently, I'll say, Biden has been in the camp of, thank you, Crusher, of um, not wanting Ukraine to lose. But he's never been in the camp of, you, of wanting Ukraine to win. Thank you, pos positively, and Annie both. Th there's a distinction there. If you don't want Ukraine to lose, it's... If Ukraine loses and Russia wins, they're going to go nuts. They're going to attack other European countries, pop, pop, pop. But if Russia loses and Ukraine wins, 
this is Biden's thinking, Putin's going to freak out. He's going to use nuclear weapons, blah, 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 right? So Biden, even though he wouldn't say it publicly, I think Biden's position has always been, he wants a tie. Now, the tie could be, now listen to this. Thank you for the hands there, Marcy, the, the hearts. The tie could be in Biden's case. I think Biden wants Ukraine to get back this territory that was stolen by Russia over the last year, but not this territory, which is Crimea, that the Russians stole in 2014. Up until now, I think Biden has, has, has wanted to give Ukraine just enough so they could get back this, but not this. And the hope was that, that they would get a lot of territory back and finally they and Russia would reach some deal. But we never wanted Ukraine to win out, right? Because we were afraid Putin will get mad. And if he gets mad, he goes, right, this kind of stuff. I think that's changing now. I think the tank decision was the first one. And I mean, any of you who've been watching know this, if you look back, when the, the decision came a few weeks ago for NATO to finally give tanks, for the US to give our tanks, right, the Germans and the Germans giving some and allowing others, I, I said that I felt like things were changing. Something, actually, what I did say was I was almost getting a little worried. Thank you, Sean. I was almost worried that the reason we were starting to send tanks Thank you, say, or Su, Stulu. <laughs> um, the reason we were giving tanks, I was getting worried, is that we were afraid Ukraine was going to lose. Maybe I mean that I, I was I was actually a little concerned. Thank you, Six Hour, as to why we were giving the tanks. Right, that basically in uh, intelligence told us Ukraine might be in trouble. Now, where I think I am now on this, and I think this is why I think it's so important. What what Biden's trip was today, Biden all along wanted a tie, I'll call it. He wanted Ukraine and Russia both to realize that neither could win. And basically, in the end, they would both have to reach some kind of deal. I don't know what deal, frankly, could be good enough, because I think the, this war, either Ukraine wins or or the war is going to keep happening again and again and again, right? It's not like if, if we let Russia keep any part of Ukraine, Russia will look at that as a victory and say, hey, it was worth it invading, because look at all these new territories we've got, right? Um, so I think, I think, um, um, ah, forgot what I was saying this with Biden and the war stuff. Um, oh, this was an important point. Help me, folks. I was on a I was on a roll here. These aren't from my notes. These are from things I wanted to talk about. So all of a sudden, my my notes are in a totally other direction. Um, about the war. About oh yeah, about Biden. Uh, oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. So in order for uh, Biden and Ukraine, or Biden for Russia and Ukraine to have a tie, okay, both sides have to come to the realization that fighting won't help. They won't be able to win the war. Well, Russia is convinced they're going to win this war. And I think over the last couple months, quick, quick sip of water. I think over the last couple months, Biden came to the realization that, that Russia is not going to give up. That no matter what happens, Putin is not going to turn around and say, you know what, we can't win this. We need to negotiate. So all of a sudden, Biden's been put in the position that Russia is hell bent on winning this war. And mind you, remember, at the starting point of this discussion from where Biden, I think, was a year ago, was we cannot let Ukraine lose because that will empower Putin to attack other European countries, including NATO. But we can't let Ukraine win entirely because then Russia will use their nukes. Well, if Russia is refusing to negotiate and Biden has now concluded that there's no chance of getting Russia to negotiate, then Russia is going to stay in it until they win. And if Russia wins, it's the worst case scenario, which means Russia is then empowered to attack other European countries. So Biden is now changing his thinking and saying, OK, if, if Russia's not going to negotiate, we've got to A, give Ukraine more weapons so that they don't lose, and B, what we've seen in the last month in the papers talking about was maybe we give Ukraine just enough weapons that Ukraine can start threatening Crimea. Now, again, remember, um, Crimea is the Ukrainian territory in the south that the Russians invaded and stole in 2014. It's the territory Russia doesn't want to lose this that they stole, but they really don't want to lose this. Putin really does not want to use Crimea, uh, lose Crimea. So Biden, and again, I'll, I'll stop with this point and sort of get to your questions. Biden is still doing incrementalism in terms of slowly, slowly giving better and better weapons, slowly getting a little more hawkish here, because now he's saying, well, now he's saying, and I'm saying, I'm reading between the lines here. Biden hasn't said this publicly, but I think now Biden is saying, 
I still don't want Ukraine to win Crimea entirely because I'm afraid Putin will freak out and use his nukes. But the only way, and this was in the paper a few weeks ago, actually, the only way to convince Putin to negotiate is to give Ukraine the weapons that make it possible for Ukraine to win at least part of Crimea back so Putin feels threatened and he negotiates. So what you're seeing now is the U.S. is, is I think, and Biden wanting to give Ukraine better and better weapons, but I still think he's a smidgen short of wanting Ukraine to all-out win. He still wants some kind of a negotiated settlement that I don't think you can have. Um, the uh, the fi- oh, the other point I was going to make here with actually, you know what? Let me let me look at questions really quick, and then I want to continue. Hold on, I'm going to stay as uh, Zelensky friendly. A lot of things to talk about with this today. We'll probably go late. Yeah, normally I stop on the hour, but there's so much to talk about with this. And I think it's an important day. Um, Elise, oh, thank you for the hat there, Neil. Uh, I chuckled to notice how your point about Ukraine winning and Russia losing was explicitly discussed in Munich by many, notably Kuleba. Oh, was it? Oh, I did not see that. Oh, thank you, Crusher, for the slime. Well, you know, it's funny. It's a, it is a point that you are finally seeing more. I've been saying this for a while, okay? I've been saying for a while that... Uh, months ago, actually, months ago, I criticized Biden. Yep, I've got Evo as well. Months ago, I criticized Biden because I said his speech, he said, we can't let Russia win. And he said, and then it, later in the speech, this was in Poland months ago, we can't let Ukraine lose. And everyone interpreted it as saying Ukraine win, Russia needs to lose. He didn't say that. He said, we can't let Russia win. That could still be a tie. We can't let Ukraine lose. That could still be a tie. And I was telling everybody from the beginning, Biden wants a tie. He wants both countries, both countries, yeah, both countries so tired out that they negotiate. Oh, by the way, the sound on the uh, on uh, on TikTok is going to echo more because I am in a apartment with 11 and 12 foot ceilings and my microphone is no longer cooperating with my iPad because my good mic used to work with the iPad. Now you're getting the room echo. So sorry about that. But you're getting wreck. You're getting echo. What can I do for you guys? Um... Six Evo, thoughts on the Russian billboard and Putin's speech? Yeah, so, well, the, so uh, Putin's got a big speech coming up tomorrow. Biden does too, actually. This is this is very interesting. Biden kind of stepped on Putin's toes today. Putin has a huge speech tomorrow. Uh, his speech is at noon Moscow time. I always forget, is it eight, nine hours? Hey, Google, how many hours ahead is Moscow? Okay, they're eight hours ahead of the American East Coast. So that means 4 a.m. our time. Uh, Putin is giving his speech in Moscow. Um, Hey, Putin, what is the time difference between Warsaw and Moscow? Did I say, hey, Putin? I said, hey, Putin. (laughs) Hey, Google, what is the time difference between Warsaw and Moscow? That's funny. Oh, okay. Moscow is two hours ahead of Warsaw. So if Moscow is at noon, Warsaw is at 10 a.m. that Putin will be making his speech. That's interesting. Um, I know, hey, Putin. Hey, Putin. The new Apple's, That's one of Apple's earlier versions of Siri that just didn't take off. Hey, Putin. <laughs> For some reason, it wasn't very popular. Um, so, uh, yeah. So Biden is going to be making, he's already in Poland. Basically, the way it works for any anybody going to Ukraine, you fly into Poland and then you take a train all the way to Ukraine. It's a 10-hour train ride to Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. That's what Biden did. He then left, took the train back, and now he's in probably in Warsaw for the night. And tomorrow he's going to be meeting with President Duda of Poland and then will be giving a major speech tomorrow. Biden's trip today, but also his speech tomorrow, I think, is is also in part meant to step on uh, on Putin's toes because Putin's big speech is tomorrow. The anniversary of the war is the 24th. Tomorrow was the big speech. People were wondering, is Putin going to declare war finally? Because this isn't officially a war yet. Is he going to uh, announce a new mobilization, like a new draft? It, who knows, right? So all the speculation has been on what will Putin do? And all of a sudden now, it's it, it reminds me of, um you know, the eye of Sauron in... Um, in Lord of the Rings. Thank you, Annie. Where all of a sudden the eye finally knows that Frodo is getting close and you see it go whoop <laughs> in the eye. And I feel like that's kind of like what, what's been going on with this, where everyone was focused on Putin and all of a sudden Biden arrived and now it's like whoop. And there's Putin on the other side going, me, 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 hello, me. So uh, definitely this was good. 
this was good for for kind of you know sticking it to Putin. Thank you, Nathan. There. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have been saying they don't think Putin's going to say anything. I think Putin might feel the need to up the ante now that Biden did this because this upstaged him. Um, uh, let me look here. I'm actually going to in a second. Uh, let me see a little bit here. Let me see. I mean, I've got a lot of things to talk about. I'm just trying to think here. Um, yeah, that's, you know, um, I guess I'll just say this really quick. I, I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think at the very least, one of the things that Putin uh, has been doing, thank you, Ali, is um, the Russians, well, two things actually I was going to tell you. One, the Russian military bloggers are pissed that, that, that Biden showed up and Putin let him. Thank you, referee, for that. And who was that? An L. Um, Putin himself, the Russians, are back to their messaging. The only messaging, they're trying to say the trip doesn't matter. And they're also trying to say, the big messaging again today was, this is more proof that we are not at war with Ukraine. We are at war with NATO. The thing is, you're losing your war. I guess it's less embarrassing to be losing your war. You know, your three-day war, mind you, this is a three-day war that is now four days away from being a one-year war, right? Remember three days? They were going to win it in three days. Um, it is less embarrassing for Russia to be losing its three-day war to NATO than to be losing its three-day war to itty-bitty Ukraine, right? I mean, from Russia's perspective. So I guess that's true. But it, it I do not understand an argument, which is what the Russians keep doing. What, what they are telling their citizens is the reason we're losing is because we're fighting NATO. Well, if the reason we're losing is because we're fighting NATO, then maybe we shouldn't be fighting NATO, right? I mean, it, it, isn't this, I mean, the, the Russians keep talking about nuclear war and all this kind of crap with us. But if you're admitting that you can't win against us, then why are you picking a fight with us? Right. Why are you trying to make the war against? I mean, I just I, I think it's a I get it for the people back home, you know, NATO, evil NATO, evil America. But at the same time, the underlying message is we, Russia, are very weak because we can't beat NATO. Thank you, Patty, for the wave. I just think it's I just think it's a bad messaging point from the Russians. Um, All right. Let me do a quick little uh quick little pitch for my discord and then we'll keep talking about this. So uh, one of the ways that um. Uh, just to remind people too, if you're new on TikTok, this is the Aravosis Report. It's my nightly show, Monday to Friday, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, U.S., and where I talk about the latest news from Ukraine. Normally, I do like you know half a half a show with questions and then half with the news. Uh, there's a lot of news today with Biden visiting Ukraine, so I'm going to do more with the news and then I'll stay late. So we'll still have ample time for questions. But I do this full time. I do it. Uh, uh, nobody pays me to do it. The way I'm able to afford doing this is basically you guys, you guys giving gifts. So thank you for the gifts on TikTok. Thank you for the super chat. Another way we do it is with my Discord. I've got a Discord community. You can find the link in my profile on TikTok via the Linktree link has all my links. You guys, Aravosis.com has all my links. And it's discord.aravosis.com if you want to go directly. But one of the things we do in the Discord, it's free, but you can pay if you want. Um, we Thank you, Bonnie. We do that, and Tattooed. We do that via Patreon. Uh, you can find it out there. But one of the ways people help me is I have, a, I have an auction. Um, I wanted to figure out ways of raising money for Ukraine. And I raised a lot of money directly, and still am, uh, directly from all of you. Just so you know, you guys have pitched in directly over $80,000 to help Ukraine. And that's money that I've been, I've pretty much had you guys send directly to Ukraine because I didn't want to touch it. <laughs> I just think it's, it's well, also for taxes, frankly, it's easier, but I didn't want anybody saying you're taking the money, blah, blah, blah. So that money pretty much has all gone straight to Ukraine. Over $80,000 humanitarian aid. We've even helped buy... Um, Starlink, don't don't tell Elon. Uh, you know, Starlink systems in the past, other things for the Ukrainians. And um, one of the other things we do with my Discord is we have an auction because I wanted to showcase cool Ukrainian stuff that we're able to get in Ukraine, but at the same time, raise some money to support my work because I'm doing this for free and full time, so I'm not rich, um, and to support Ukraine. So we've been having an auction. 50% of the proceeds from the auction go to Ukraine. 50% go to me to literally pay my bills because I am doing this full time. And just to show you, we've got very cool stuff right now. So um, today you'll see Biden meeting uh, Zelensky and then meeting with a bunch of Zelensky's advisors. If you look closely, you will see this military patch on the shoulder of a bunch of Zelensky's advisors. Well, 
I've been auctioning off these military patches, real military patches from Ukraine. So I'm putting this up as an auction item with its cohort. This is kind of cool. Obviously, the top one is the Ukrainian flag, right? Well, what's the bottom one? And I asked my friend Vlad in Ukraine, I said, what's the deal with it being just green and green? He said, that's so that at night you don't get shot by snipers, which I thought was very interesting. So this is the same thing as this, but it's meant to blend in more. So we've got this one auctioning off just for fun. I've got a Ukrainian flag that a, a woman in Ukraine had made that we're auctioning off. I've got, well, I'll show you this airplane. This is the last box, my final box of airplane parts. This is a Russian fighter jet that was shot down over Ukraine by the Ukrainians and Ukrainian charity boxed it with a whole cool commemorative box. And I've got two pieces of the jet here. The, actually, the one piece is our biggest yet that we've been putting out. Four and a half inches, uh, 10 centimeters, I think, 11 centimeters. But two pieces of the Russian fighter jet that were shot down. Very cool. Um, and finally, which I'm very excited because I'm wearing tonight, my Zelensky sweatshirts finally came in this weekend or on Friday. We found the sweatshirts that President Zelensky wears uh, everywhere. You know how uh, literally this is the sweatshirt. Um, we found the Ukrainian company that, that I mean, they even advertise that they're the place. So we bought a bunch of them and we've, we're auctioning those off as well. So I'm wearing it tonight. I'm deciding if I'm going to keep it. So usually I haven't kept too much of the stuff. I've been auctioning off most of it. So go check out discord.erevosis.com for the whole kit and caboodle. All right. Let's go back to this. Um, I want to see if there's anything more that I wanted to mention here. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that's it. Let me move on to, um, well, okay, really quick. The Russian military bloggers, this was funny. The Russian military bloggers are a very powerful contingent in Russia. They're basically former military people who go on social, I mean, not unlike what I do with you guys, who go on social media and express their opinions. Well, um, because they use Telegram and other services, a lot of times they write up their ideas. So they'll write a couple paragraphs on how this battle's going, this kind of stuff. And Putin was dumb enough to actually let them hang out with the military, the Russian military, and all of this. Um, you know, basically, so they could see firsthand what was what was happening. Well, what's been happening? Russia's not been doing well. <laughs> so these military bloggers who are basically far-right nationalists, these are the people who think that the Russians aren't killing enough Ukrainian civilians, okay? These guys have been livid about the way the war is going. Well, listen to this. This was, um, I think I got this from Sky News. The Russian military bloggers are saying that it's an embarrassment that Putin let Biden go in today and not worry about Biden's safety. Um, it's uh, the fact that we notified Russia before shows that Putin allowed Biden. Oh yeah, so the fact that the Americans notified Russia that, that Biden was going in the military bloggers, the Russian military bloggers are saying that proves that Putin approved the trip because by the Americans were basically saying, look, we're going in, you better not attack. And they're saying Putin could have told him, I'm not going to promise you that you better not go. So the military bloggers are blaming Putin for approving Biden's trip and giving it this um, stamp of safety, basically, which I think is just hilarious. The other thing is, um, actually, that's it for that. So, um, the Oh, yeah, the Italian prime minister. This was kind of sad, actually. Italy's prime minister, the new prime minister, Georgia Maloney, um, is in Ukraine today as well, in Kiev. It's getting no press at all um, because of Biden's big surprise trip. I w I'm guessing the Americans probably didn't tell the Italians because if they knew, thank you, music, if, if the Italians knew, they probably wouldn't have scheduled their trip at the same time as Biden's trip because she's not getting any attention at all. And at least she'd be getting attention Otherwise, because A, she's the leader of a major NATO country, B, her coalition is very far right and borderline, you know, fascist, uh, but she's actually been very good. Thank you for the balloons there, Jean Marquis. Uh, she's actually been very good on Ukraine. Her coalition's terrible on Ukraine, but she's great. So actually, it, it it's too bad because... This is a this is very important and a good deal that she is in Ukraine because it's it establishes that personal connection between her and Zelensky, which, by the way, uh, you'll remember when Zelensky went to the States to visit Biden in was it December now? And it was kind of that that was a surprise visit. And I was saying how those things are important because the personal connection matters. It really in politics, it it matters when you know people, even though a president, President Biden is going to make a decision 
on what he does in foreign policy based on America's best interests, the personal relationships with foreign leaders actually make a difference. Um, so that was good that Biden did it. Thank you, Crusher. And that's why it's good that that, um, that Georgia Maloney is there today. Um, more news. Um, so oh, I was going to take about, the, you know, I'm going to do this anyway. We're going long tonight, but I don't care. I'll stay long. Don't worry. Because the next section I wanted to talk about was the state of the war and how things are going and how there's a lot of talk among the military experts that they don't think Russia is going to do very well with this spring offensive. Um, remember now for the last few months, we've been worrying about Russia uh, basically doing some big counterattack this spring. There was some concern it was going to happen now, right? By now, there was some concern it was going to happen maybe the end of March, middle of April. Well, now what people think is the Russians started their counterattack a few weeks ago, that it pretty much was the fighting that's been going on in the East, okay? Pretty much, remember, Bakhmut has been the really big fighting around there. Thank you, Tattooed and AD Deuce, <laughs> Jeff, both of you. Uh, the big fighting around Bakhmut. There was also, here a little bit further south, these are all the front line. The front line between Russian troops and Ukrainian troops is more or less eh, like this, okay? So everything south of my finger here is Russian. Everything east of my finger is Russian. So this is all Russian. So here and here, there have been some big battles going on. The southern city, which was Volodar, the Russians got just destroyed. Um, the northern city, Bakhmut, a lot of Russians dying and not making that much progress. Um, what? Let me just read you this. Institute for the Study of War did a greater analysis on what they think is going to happen with, th with this offensive that's going on. And most of the experts now, now mind you, I will, I will put the caveat out there. This doesn't mean it's not going to be bloody as hell. This doesn't mean a lot of Ukrainians aren't going to die. This doesn't mean Ukraine's going to win. But the conventional wisdom now amongst the military experts seems to be that they don't think much is going to happen with this spring offensive that Russia's doing. Um, let me read you this. The um, Institute for the Study of War, a very big defense think tank here in Washington, D.C., very respected. This report folk forecasts the unlikelihood of significantly increased Russian offensive operations this winter. So basically saying they don't even think there's going to be much more than what's happening right now. The major phase of Russian offensive operations in Luhansk, which is in the east, is underway. And Russia likely lacks sufficient uncommitted reserves. They mean Russia lacks sufficient troops that are already not working elsewhere, right? The reserves are the extra troops that they had because of the uh, the big mobilization they did in September and October, the big draft they had. They so so listen, so the uncommitted reserves means extra men you're not using yet. Read this again. The uh, Russia likely lacks sufficient uncommitted reserves to dramatically increase the scale or intensity of the offensive this winter. So in other words, Russia can't do much more than what they're doing because they literally don't have any extra men to do it. They're already doing enough elsewhere. Um, the Russian offensive will very likely continue for some time and may temporarily gain momentum as the final reserves are committed, if they are but will very likely culminate. Culminate means in military terms, when you are uh, attacking and finally you get so tired, you're, too many of your men are killed and injured, uh, too many of your vehicles are injured, um, you, know, you start running out of fuel, ammunition, that instead of going on the offense, you start to go on the defense, right? It's almost, imagine, imagine it in a way like a runner in a race and how the runner somebody who decides he's going to run really fast at the beginning of a long race and he's ahead of everybody, well, all of a sudden he starts getting tired and he starts falling back. That's kind of the concept of culminating in the military. It's rather than being on the offensive, you've kind of done everything you can and now you're on the defensive. So what ISW is saying is um, uh, Russia will likely continue for some time, may do some temporary gains, but will very likely culminate, kind of reach their their maximum and then have to pull back well short of its objectives and likely short of achieving operationally significant gains. So Institute for Study of War, this big think tank, thinks that the Russians aren't going to make any significant gains at all in this huge offensive they're doing right now. Um, they did. Uh, it explains why. They did not leave enough time to train their mobilized reservists to standards sufficient to support large-scale offensive mechanized maneuver warfare. In other words, 
they didn't train their troops and they should have waited much longer for this offensive and trained them longer. And they clearly lack the equipment necessary to kit out their reconstituted units and they don't have enough equipment. Now, put that together with, there've been lots of reports that the Russians um, basically were under pressure from Putin, that Putin was sick of losing. The Ukrainians have been doing so well. And he said for the one year anniversary that is literally four days from now, February 24th, I want a big victory. Start the attack now is what the thinking is. And just like, frankly, the idiocy at the beginning of the war, when a lot of I mean, our experts were all saying the Russians didn't have enough troops, that even though, yes, Putin had 160,000 to 200,000 troops or whatever, but our experts were saying that's not enough for this invasion he's planning and they were right. But Putin went in anyway. It looks like he's doing the same stupid thing this time around, which is great for Ukraine, right? Thank you, Shaw, Shosanna. Um, the, uh, let me just see here really quick. Um, yeah, that's kind of it on that one. Though. The Oh, I know I was going to tell you. The other thing I read, I, I didn't put it in my notes, but I was going to mention. Another big problem the Russians are having is they are fighting on like five or six different fronts now. Meaning, you know, this battle, that battle, that battle, that battle, different parts of the different parts of the country. So in other words, the battles aren't reinforcing each other. It's not like, I don't even know, you've got 10,000 troops. Rather than the 10,000 troops going at one city, thank you, dear Benji, you've got 2,000 troops at this city, 2,000 troops going after this city, 2,000 troops going here, so that they're not reinforcing each other. This is what the idiots did at the beginning of the war. Remember at the beginning of the war, the Russians didn't have enough troops, but they invaded. And this is just from memory. But as I recall, you had you at least you had one front here through Crimea, right? Russia's occupying Crimea, the, the bridge here from Russia that got blown up a couple months ago. You had the Russians invade here. You had the Russians invade here. You had the Russians invade here. You had, I believe, here and you certainly had here. You had like five different fronts in the war. And people were saying, five fronts? Are you crazy? They're doing it again. They're doing it again. And that's another reason why people are saying it looks like the Russians haven't learned their lessons and they may have just as much of a difficult time now with this uh, with this battle. Um, before I give you the final news, um, I've also got a Patreon account. Up. I appreciate that. By the way, thank you so much. You guys have been very nice whenever I mention Patreon. A couple of you have signed up uh, every episode when I've mentioned it. So thank you. Patreon is basically a site where people can use it to uh, give you a donation every month. So it's it's just a monthly thing. It could be $5 a month, $10 a month. Some people, one guy's giving $100 a month. God bless you. <laughs> um, the uh, Thank you for the gift there, Tattooed for the Hedgehog. And um, it's just, it's a nice way for creator, whether it's me or other creators you work with, it's a nice way for them to know how much money's coming in, which is really nice. Um, so anyway, if you've been, I always say, if you've been watching me for a long time now, you like my work. The gifts are very helpful too. So thank you, Grayson, for the for the 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 hydro slime and all the questions and stickers on on YouTube. Um, but if you can go over to patreon.com slash Erevosis, again, you'll find the link in my profile. You'll find the link at Erevosis.com and help out via Patreon. That would be amazing. Um, hey, one wonderful, generous guy is doing hundred dollars a month, and we have a wonderful chat once a month, one on one, because that's the commitment I made for the hundred dollars a month, and it's nice. Thank you for the heart there. And we do, we have a great chat. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. All right, back to the news. Um, Italy says it is open to sending fighter jets to Ukraine along other Western allies. You know, uh, thank you, Zoe. I hear that kind of stuff. And I just, uh, the, uh, the reason I'm telling you that news is I think there's a lot of BS news like that, that we get from the allies where basically they don't, they don't say I am sending you fighter jets. They say, I'm open to sending you fighter jets. And what does that mean? Right? Maybe, well, maybe it's nice. Maybe it doesn't uh, win the war. Um, also, Italy said, get this, Italy does not want to be the first ally to send fighter jets. <laughs> so in other words, maybe they'll send them, but they won't be first. This is something that I've said from the beginning is that it seems like the NATO allies are in a, oh, hey, Caton, that's funny. Wow, fire dog leg. Yeah, that's been a while. Um, it seems like 
the NATO allies are, are, I've heard this in politics called a race to be second, where basically rather than it's a race to be first, everyone's in a race to be second. <laughs> Nobody wants to be the first to provide the weapons. Everybody wants to be the second to provide the weapons. You know, we saw this with Germany and its tanks. It wanted America to give tanks too, which, you know, I kind of can appreciate. And this is the same thing. We've seen it with the planes. Everyone says, oh, we'll give planes, but not until you give planes. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, Navalny, this is another interesting story. So um, Navalny, who's the Russian opposition leader, somewhat controversial in the West. He's very well looked upon. Ukrainians don't like the guy. Among other things, he defended the invasion of, uh, of the annexation of Crimea by Russia, where they stole it, I believe. So Ukrainians have never been a big fan of Navalny. In the West, though, he's considered a lot of Westerners look at him as much better than Putin. Well, listen to this. Jailed critic Navalny's team issued a statement today calling for the restoration of Ukraine's 90, 1991 borders and the payment of reparations by Moscow. Now, that's a huge deal. Um, the 1991 borders means when the Soviet Union fell apart. OK, so that means like the borders before Russia intervened and started stealing land. That's great. Um, Russia paying reparations is huge for him to be saying this now. My point here isn't to say that, you know, our Ukrainian friends are wrong about Navalny. I think, frankly, the criticism they were putting out there has made a difference. I think Navalny's people are seeing that because of this, because of everything he's been, because of his past, frankly, not being as good as he should be, um, you know, that he himself is a Russian nationalist. That's damn good. That's damn good. Um, so anyway, I'm just bringing it up. I think that was interesting news. Uh, China, increased concern about the Chinese possibly giving uh, weapons to Russia. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations yesterday said on one of the uh, show, I think on CNN I was watching, that it would be a red line for America if, if China goes ahead and gives weapons to, to Russia. So that's going to be a big deal. And finally, actually, this is an important, this is today has been such an interesting news day. This is why I warned you guys I was going to go a little late tonight because listen to this. This is a great hat. Thank you, Happy Beach and bad feeling for the hat. Listen to this story. Prigozhin, this is in Reuters today. Prigozhin is the, I think it's Yevgeny's his first name, I forget. He is uh, the oligarch, the billionaire, sort of corrupt billionaire, who is in charge of the Wagner mercenary group which is basically uh, they're soldiers for hire, okay? They've been fighting in Ukraine, but they've also been fighting in Africa and other places. They're um, hired murderers, really. I mean, they're, there's no morals. There's no, they, they just, they're horrific, war crimes. Any case, he's been fighting in Eastern Ukraine. He's specifically been fighting in um, Bakhmut, that town in the East we talk about a lot, Bakhmut, where, where the major fighting is taking place right now. Most of it has been his men. His men, just to remind you, his men are the ones who went and recruited a bunch of the Russian prisoners to the prisons and told them, if you fight for us, we'll, you know, we'll expunge your record. So that's who Prigozhin is. He's been getting, he's been constantly getting into a, you know, match with the Russian Ministry of Defense because he is independent, right? You've got the Russian military, and then you've got these guys who are hired guns. They're all working for Putin, but the military guys do not like the Prigozhin guys because because the Prigozhin guys are not Russian military. And Prigozhin's existence, the reason Prigozhin's military exists, the uh, Wagner mercenary group, is because the Russian military sucks. <laughs> I mean, basically, you wouldn't have to have Prigozhin fighting in Ukraine if the Russian military were good enough. And Prigozhin is the first person to tell you this. So the regular military guys hate his guts. Well, listen to this. Reuters reports today that Prigozhin says the Ministry of Defense is denying his forces, meaning the Wagner mercenaries in eastern Ukraine, denying them ammunition, putting their lives and the war at risk. Um, in an audio message put out by his press service, Prigozhin says he was required to apologize and obey in order to get more ammunition. His voice was angry and raised, and he said, quote, um, thank you for the heart there, El. His voice was angry and raised, and he said, quote, I'm unable to solve this problem 
meaning it's still going on. I'm unable to solve this problem despite all my collection, connections and contacts. Those who interfere with us trying to win this war are absolutely directly working for the enemy. I mean, this is, go again, I bring this up because this is golden. These guys hate each other. You cannot have all of these troops fighting in Ukraine, okay? The Russians, the well, the, the Russian Ministry of Defense, this Russian mercenary groups, when they hate each other's guts, because not only do they not work together well, we always hear about morale and cohesion and all of this, right? Not only do they not work together well, but now you've got the Russian Defense Ministry cutting off the ammunition of Prigozhin's fighters when they're in the middle of fighting the Ukrainians in Bakhmut. This is hilarious. I mean, it's it's... It's great. It's absolutely great news. Let's see what happens. I mean, but it's but it's more evidence. I will put it this way. It's more evidence that that Russia might have problems with this whole counteroffensive it's planning right now and for the spring if this is the way its troops are treating each other. That's good news. All right, let's get to the questions. As I said, um, I'm going late tonight because we had so much news with Biden's trip to Ukraine and everything else. So, uh, you know, we'll do questions till at least quarter after, maybe maybe even 20 after or later. All right, uh, TikTok, submit your questions, please, via the, um, the Q&A link in my profile, if you would. The rest of you can use the box at the bottom of the screen. Hang on, I'm going to make sure my... Uh, my fan is on because I'm I'm wearing my Zelensky sweatshirt today, my which we we auction off on my Discord. The actual sweatshirts that Zelensky, well, not the one he wore, but this got them from the same company he gets them from. But they're really warm. <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually hot in here. Um, well, we know the sweatshirts work. <laughs> there you go. Keep you warm in Ukraine. Um, thank you for the gift there, Dawn. Let me. Oops. Otan Bot is asking if Biden will visit other European countries in the next few days. Uh, we know he's in Poland. I don't know that there were plans. I don't know if there were plans to go anywhere else. That I don't know. That I don't know. So haven't heard anything. Um, the uh, de -de 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 I don't know. I find this a little strange. So WC Fields is asking um, implications of Russia gaining control over Moldova. Um, Moldova is a country. OK, Romania. OK, NATO ally, more or less over here. I mean, I'm, I may not get it perfect, but Romania is kind of a big country over here. Between Romania and Ukraine, you've got Moldova, former Soviet um, and uh, very closely related to uh, Romania. Okay, speak the same language. Maybe I was I was even reading up on the language this weekend. Uh, they both speak the Romanian or a little bit of a different dialect. Um, Moldova even talks about Moldova possibly reunifying someday with with Romania so they can join the EU and NATO and everything else. And then you've got this little breakaway province called Transnistria that's around here that the Russians have been behind, just like they have been behind all this garbage in Eastern Ukraine, right? Trying to basically create um, create trouble. Now, the Russians have talked, uh, not talked, Zelensky has warned, and the, I believe it's president, uh, is she president or prime minister? The head of Moldova came out and said that they are very worried the Russians are planning a coup, okay? To basically overthrow Moldova and put somebody who's pro-Russian. Currently, the head of the country, and I believe the next president, or the next head, is very pro-Western. Um, and as I said, there's talk about maybe even, you know, reunifying with Romania, joining the West, big deal. Um, so the question is, would Putin really try to, I think, look, if Putin could overthrow the government, have somebody more pro-Russian, why not, right? I mean, it helps him in the long terms, in terms of reunification. It helps him because also you've got Moldova on the border here, well, with Transnistria, on the border with Ukraine. You know, the question there from W.C. Fields is Odessa. Odessa, Ukraine is right here. Big city, very important. Currently, hard for the Russians to attack Odessa because they're on they're down here. They're on this side of the river, and it's just not easy for them to cross. The, they, they even lost. The Russians lost their land north of the river in the last couple months. So the Russians not in a good position here to attack Odessa. If they were to get Moldova, 
right? All of a sudden, does that put them in a better position to attack Odessa? Maybe, but then again, you've then got another front in the war. So now Russia's going to have a sixth or seventh front in the war. I mean, knowing the Russians, they might try it, right? right? Kind of stupid of them, you know, way too many fronts, but who knows? Um, interesting. Don't know. Copies is asking about uh, uh, alternatives to Starlink, internet and competitors. I don't know. I don't know. Um, let me look for some TikTok questions on here. Thank you, B. Uh, B. Smith, that looks like you may have intended a question. If you did, feel free to write it. I'm going to guess that's what that's what that was. Uh, sorry, let me pull up TikTok for Q&A. You must be 18 year old or above to continue. Okay. <laughs> okay, that was weird. TikTok suddenly wanted me to be 18. I'm like, okay, I'm 18. Um, do you think the Russian people know what's going on yet? This is coming from Stephen Moore. Do you see World War III coming? No. Do the Russian people know what's going on? Yeah, probably. I just subscribed to you as well. Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, you know, Russia's a dictatorship, but at the same time, because of the internet and everything, people know, it. if people want to know what's going on, they know what's going on, right? Enough Russians, it's, it's not like Russia has cut down, cut off the entire internet. Right. I mean, uh, YouTube is still not censored. So, I mean, literally, we could have Russians watching this with translation or something if they wanted to or just watch in English and they'd be getting the news every day. Right. So I, I don't the, and, and opinion polls are showing support for the war dropping in Russia. Now, opinion polls in Russia are kind of scary. And to start with, because, you know, you're in a you're in a increasing dictatorship. People don't want to give opinions. Hey, do you support the dictator's war? What are you going to say, right? No, <laughs> go to jail. The fact that support has actually been dropping for the war is very interesting because it suggests that, yet you know, maybe it actually is dropping since normally people wouldn't want to admit that, right? Um, so I I, I think people and and you got a lot of death. I was reading uh, I think it was in Sky News today, maybe Sky News. Yeah, it wasn't. Thank you, Jean Marquis was um, looking at just Russian social media and how there's increased chatter on Russian social media that um, people are talking about the deaths, their friends dying, people they know, and like another one, you know, 23 years old and putting their pictures up there. You can't have 200,000 Russians killed or injured, which is what we think there is at this point. Maybe 60,000 Russians dead, 140,000 Russians you know, injured, but injured to the point where they've got to go back home, you know, losing, losing limbs, losing arms, losing legs. You can't have this many without starting to, um, without starting to, to pe for people to notice. So, I mean, I think they know, I'm just not convinced they're ever going to, you know, ever going to change anything. Um, okay. Roshin, did you, did you find B Smith? Okay. You did find B Smith. Okay. Um, saw a retired Colonel on CNN today, he thinks Putin is starting to have doubts about the war. That's interesting. That was that could have been. Thank you, Betty, for the hydra slime. Up oh, and eighty deuce for the hat. That could have been Colonel Layton, who I really like, because um, I was watching CNN today too. He was on. They may have had some other guys on, but Colonel Layton's very good. Um, I did not see that Putin starting to have doubts about the war. That's interesting. I mean, look, I, I mean Putin's not stupid. I mean, he, he's, he's a little too megalomaniac. And I think like anybody in positions like that, it, it reminds me of bosses, you know, just the whole, like, I don't care if you can't do it, do it. And you're like, well, that's not the way it works. If I literally can't do it, I can't do it. <laughs> Telling me do it anyway, by the way, you can imagine which boss I'm talking about. We're not going to name names. Um, but yelling at your staff doesn't really help. You know, if, if they just, I mean, th this, actually, it's the boss at the UN. She would just say stuff that you didn't understand. And you'd say, I have, I just have no idea what you're talking about. And she'd literally go to me, that's because you're not listening. <laughs> and you're kind of going, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, but anyway, it's kind of the same thing, like just ordering people to, you know, fight and you're going to win. Um, but in any case, I don't know. I mean, if anything, I think Putin, Putin having doubts might be Putin is worried. Putin should be worried. It's taken a year. NATO has not dropped back. Um, and, you know, meaning NATO has not fallen apart. I know we don't say UN, the, 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 <laughs> the job that shall not be named. And I won't say Mila, who's the corrupt, incompetent boss who didn't know what she was doing. 
And I'd be very surprised if there, she hasn't left a long stream of staffers who need to know that if they simply rise up, a lot of other people will rise up and support you. And that's all I've got to say about that for the moment. Um, but they all know who they are and they all know who she is. She's running an organization now, which just boggles my mind. I mean, terror, this person, absolute terror. The woman who yelled at me because my uncle died and I went to his funeral and she started scolding me. With I had tears in my eyes and she's scolding me. Anyway, we don't, this is why we don't talk about the United Nations. The worst job on the planet is working at the United Nations. We don't talk about it. All right. All right. Back to this again. So um, let me, uh, oops, make sure. Oh, Anya, Anya, Anya. Let me pull this up again so I can highlight Anya's. Here we go. Anya, thank you, by the way, for your question. Why aren't we referring more to the 90s treaty where the Russians agreed to not threaten Ukraine's sovereignty? Yes, the Budapest Memorandum, I believe, um, where the Russians agreed to not threaten Ukraine's sovereignty for Ukraine to give up its nukes. Correct. Seems like proof to the world not to trust them. You know, that's a great point. I mean, the, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. You're right. Now, this was a memorandum that was signed, you know, not a treaty, but close to a treaty, right? Not a, a memorandum between Russia, America, Ukraine, and then also, I believe, the Brits and the French, kind of a secondary thing. And basically, when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, 1991 was the year the Soviet Union ceased to exist. The Soviet Union was basically a parasite. I mean, it ate a bunch of other countries, and that's how it existed. It threw together 15 different countries that did not belong together. 14 of them, eh, maybe 14, maybe a little less than 14, didn't want to be there, right? Ukraine didn't want to be there. The Baltic states didn't want to be there. A lot of them, Georgia, I mean, a lot of these countries did not want to be there. And the Russians basically terrorized them into being one country, right? The Soviet Union, one of the worst dictatorships in world history. Not as bad as North Korea, but pretty damn bad. Um, so you've got... Um, uh, Russia dissolves. Russia stops existing in 1991. And all of the former Soviet countries, well, they still exist. So if the Soviet Union had nukes in Ukraine, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. So if the Soviet Union dissolves, what happens? Ukraine becomes an independent country, but they've still got nukes. They've still got their weapons because each, it's sort of like the US, right? You've got weapons around the country. And if, if the country splits in two, who gets the weapons, right? If both of us are America. So that's what happened. So the Ukrainians inherited a bunch of uh, fighter jets and other, other weapons, but they also inherited nuclear weapons. Well, I forget, thousands of them. So the Ukrainians turn around and the Russians are not thrilled. And frankly, we weren't thrilled either. I think the U.S. was worried about even more countries having nukes. And then partially because we want a monopoly on it, obviously, but also partially it's just probably not safe. You know, Like with Iran getting them now, probably not a good idea. So we all got together and with Ukraine signed this memorandum that Ukraine would give up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise from Russia to guarantee Ukraine's borders, basically, and its, you know, its sovereignty. They wouldn't muck in Ukraine. And the US and Britain and France pretty much kind of sort of guaranteed that we'd make sure Russia did, you know, Russia didn't invade. Even though we didn't quite promise, we kind of promised. Well, what happens? Russia invades, Ru no, Russia meddles a lot in Ukraine. Then they invade in 2014. And what do we do? Eh, right? Not that much. Um, then they invaded last year and we helped with weapons, but it's not like we went to war. And even with the weapons we helped, as I always say, we kind of started helping and then slowly better weapons, slowly better weapons. And we're still not giving them the weapons they need, such as the long range missiles, probably fighter jets too, but certainly the long range missiles. Um, anyway, that gets back to, so that's the agreement that Anya is talking about where the Russians committed in this international agreement to not attack Ukraine and to respect its borders. The Russians have not respected that agreement, you know, for 30 years now. We should be mentioning that every day about how the Russians can't be trusted. Um, but I think part of the problem is we don't want to demonize Russia because A, we don't want to put Putin in a corner and make him mad. And B, I think the Biden administration thinks that if we demonize Russia, then how do we step back and reach a deal? Because we, we spent a year saying they can't be trusted. So if they can't be trusted, how do you reach a peace treaty with a country that can't be trusted? This is my thinking about Biden is thinking. I think you hit Ukraine, or you hit Russia with all of this anyway, as far as I'm concerned. You know, you hit them with all of these accusations. And frankly, 
And this is something Republicans are very good at and Democrats suck at. And I've talked about this before. Marketing. Republicans know, in terms of American politics, Republicans know you take a talking point and you do it again and again and again. And you keep talking. Donald Trump, right? Build the wall, build the wall, build the wall, build the wall. Nonstop, right? Or now, Republicans, their complaint about Joe Biden, the way they try to undercut Biden on Ukraine, the biggest one they've got lately is saying, you know, he cares more about the border in Ukraine than he does the border in America. But notice how all, not all, but all the Republicans are saying it again and again. Um, DeSantis did it today. Crazy, crazy anti-Jewish laser chick. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene did it today. They're all using that talking point because they're very smart. They know in politics, you've got to repeat something a lot for it to stick. Democrats don't do that. And I think overall, thank you, Betty, we're seeing that with this messaging point, because you're right. Why don't we talk about the fact and say, this war did, because the, you know, the Putin lovers like to say, this war started in 2014 when, you know, me, 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 NATO, beep, 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 beep. And it's like, no, this war started in 1991 or 1994, actually, I believe was the memorandum. 1994, when, when, we all got together and Russia convinced us that Ukraine should get rid of its nuclear weapons because Russia wasn't going to invade. And Russia has basically been meddling in Ukraine for 30 years since. That's what, you know, and you keep hitting them on how they're dishonest, they're dishonest, they're dishonest. But, you know, again, we're trying to be their friends. And Biden, I think, is increasingly understanding that that we can't be their friends. Um, Jiggle Bells on Twitch is saying Putin, putting Putin in a corner is over he's weak if there is any step back then we'll give him power eh jingle you're missing some words there <laughs> yeah sorry i think you either you typed something wrong or missed a word sorry um well there you go too elise is saying we don't bring up the budapest memorandum because it would raise the obvious question about our failure to protect ukraine as we promised yeah there you go got the jesus people Jesus may love me, but Jesus isn't really relevant in this discussion. So do your, do your work, do your work mods. No, we get like the Jesus freaks who come and it just drives me crazy. Cause it's like, we're having a discussion about the war in Ukraine. Jumping in with the comment, Jesus loves you. It's like, okay, thanks. Margie Taylor Green thinks Jesus, well, she doesn't think Jesus loves me though. Um, thank you, Bonnie, for that. Um, Ooh, that's bad. Rachel is saying that eight Russian S-300s, the S-300s are the missiles Russia uses. And basically, I mean, they're, they're terror weapons, really, but they're also an indication of Russia not having very many good missiles yet or left. S-300s are surface-to-air mess, are surface-to-air. Oh, boy, all the Jesus trolls are here today. Go get them. Go get them, mods. Go get them. Oh, boy. All, they're, we have a swarm of Jesus freaks today. This is crazy. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Okay. A little weird. I'm a Christian, but you know what? D you don't swarm somebody's live and start going crazy about Jesus in the middle of a discussion about S 300s. Um, so in any case, the S 300s are the Russia's missile of choice they use for attacking Ukraine when they keep hitting all the Ukrainian apartment buildings and everything else. It is a surface to air missile. It is not a missile that is supposed to be used for attacking buildings. It's supposed to be used for attacking planes. And basically the aim isn't really good for attacking buildings. And what the Russians do is they just shoot it into big Ukrainian cities, hoping to kill as many people as they can. That's it. That's it. I mean, so it, they're literally using it as a terror weapon. So um, Rachel is saying that eight Russian S-300s, these missiles, were launched at Kharkiv today. Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, all the way up here on the border. Now, mind you, this is on the border with Russia. It's about 15, 20 miles from Russia. Um and what would that be, 25 kilometers or so? So it's very close to Russia. So the Russians shot uh, eight S-300s at Kharkiv today. All the launches failed. Some exploded. Some, uh, some, failed down, or some fell down. Almost all the missiles crashed in the Belgorod region. One hit a school. My God. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, that's bad. Well, and again, th well, that, you know, no, there... This is not the world's second most powerful military. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Um, all right. What else we got? Sorry, more questions on TikTok here. 
like I said, we'll probably go another 10 minutes. Um, because as I said, the new section of the show was long, so we'll do this. Do keep the gifts coming, please, on YouTube and TikTok. Your gifts help me help me do this, doing it full time. So thank you. Um, not sure what that is. Um, thank you, Timothy and Zoe, <laughs> for the stuff there. Um, well, I mean, uh, Zinwi is asking what happened to the peace talks. There aren't any peace talks. I mean, basically, neither side. What was she? Was she the dead? Okay, that was interesting. Thanks, guys, and Bonnie and user. Um, I mean, there are no peace talks. There haven't been any for a while now. Pretty much the Russian um, massacre at Bucha. Bucha was that first big. Thank you, Betty. That first big. Um, God, I mean, crime against humanity that we that we uncovered of the Russians. Thank you, Ali. Back in er, like April first or so, when the Russians left, basically. The Russians, remember the Russians invaded like this. They thought they were going to take Kiev, the capital. So they invaded from both sides. They came this way. And then they got pushed back entirely by the Ukrainians in a month. Well, when they got pushed back, Bucha, I want to say it's more or less here, like northwest of Kiev. When the Russians got pushed back, the Ukrainians got their towns back. And what they and the media that was with them found in Bucha was just a city that was destroyed and a lot of war crimes. Uh, that's the one where all the dead bodies in the main street and all these people riding their bicycles shot dead on their bike. I mean, and horrific stories from the witnesses, just, just horrible stuff. Um, in any case, so the, um, that's Bucha, the, um, oh, wait a second. I was looking here. What was the, uh, deet, 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 deet. why was I talking about Bucha guys? Sorry, I'm having a brain fart now. Um, this is funny. The, oh, I think, I think you had a, where, where did I have, I had a question from somebody then just lost it. I don't know. I had a question here. It's gone now. That was weird. Okay, never mind. Don't know why I was telling you about Bucha. Oh, well. Bill, peace talks. That was it. You're right. Peace talks. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Danny, for that. Right. So the peace talks. Um, Bucha killed the peace talks, basically. Thank you, Carla, for the llama there. Bucha killed the peace talks. Um, when that news hit, it was such a shock to the world and the Ukrainians. I mean, horrific. Not, I mean, not just human rights, but I mean, genocide, just killing of civilian, wanton killing of civilians that uh, the Ukrainians called off the talks at that point. And since then, neither side sees a benefit. The Russians, Putin thinks he can win this. Um, Zelensky, the Ukrainian people do not want to give up land, which understandably, right? It's not like, how are they going to end the war? The only way they could end the war is by giving up land, right? How are they going to do it? Thank you, Cheryl, for the duck. Um, you know, it, it's as if the Russia invaded and took Alaska. Are we going to give up Alaska? I mean, there's nothing to negotiate. So um, that's kind of where it is. There aren't peace talks now because Russia doesn't want to have them. And Ukraine doesn't really want to have them either because they don't want to give up their land. So, you know, thank you, Dawn. Oh, thank you, Dawn. That, that's a very nice one. I, I always appreciate that. Thank you. That was very generous of you. Um, oh, the French. Yeah, the French, um, the French AMX 10s are uh, a, a fighting vehicle coming from France. They are supposed to arrive by this coming weekend, or at least the first ones will arrive by this coming week weekend, by this coming weekend. Um, Swedish CV 90s. I haven't heard anything, um, but I do know the French ones. They announced again today that not only are they on their way, yeah, a light tank they're called. Not only are they on their way, but they're supposed to start arriving by this weekend. Um, the sweater is a Zelensky sweatshirt that I, I'm auctioning off on my Discord. If you go to discord.erevosis.com, I'll be, I mean, I've got a number of them. I'll be auctioning them off for several weeks. So go check it out. <laughs> weekend. <laughs> what is a weekend? Thank you, Bonnie, for that. Um, what else we got here? All right, hold on. Pull up another TikTok here. Hello, Ukraine. Uncordly in Ukraine. Where are you in Ukraine? Just curious. Um. Oop, exactly. Do a nice thank you, flower lady. Yeah, do a nice well a welcome to Uncordly there in Ukraine. Everybody. Danny, I don't know. Did you do something wrong? What'd you do? <laughs> what? Oh, are somebody being all right? I don't know. If somebody um Night Ireland, I know it's a little, it's a little late for you guys. Chip. Boop, boop, boop. All right, let me go back here. Hang on. Thank you for the gifts, guys. Um, 
What else we got? Well, that's a good question too. Um, thank you, Betty, for the for the for the flower bear. Um, Annie's asking, what options should the U.S. and European community pursue if China gives lethal military assistance? I mean, I think if China, you know, if China does that, we're going to have uh, sanctions on China. I think is going to be the next thing. It's going to be economic sanctions. And the thing is, you know, the problem is we do a lot of trade with China. So it will have a lot of impact on us, which is not good. But at the same time, China makes a lot of money by selling things to us. So it's not good for China either. And if the European Union jumps in, that could be bad, right? I mean, because European Union would. You'd think these would be sanctions in principle. That would be America, Canada, and the you know NATO, EU, whoever doing them. Um, so that could be, you know, I don't know. Um, thank, oh, thank you. And, or is it Anarin? I will never enter in with Ain. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna pronounce that wrong. But anyway, thank you. I appreciate you writing that on TikTok. Um, anyway, there you go. Um, Vic Cruz is asking on YouTube, any worries about tomorrow's speech? I mean, eh, you know, well, it depends, it depends whose speech you made. There are two speeches tomorrow. One, President Biden is going to be speaking in Poland. Two, President Putin is going to be speaking in Moscow. And uh, Putin's is at noon. Uh, noon Moscow time, which is, I think we figured out was eight hours ahead of us, maybe nine hours. I forget exactly. 10 hours. I don't even remember now. Um, you know, Biden's speech needs to be very, Bi I think Biden's done a bad job selling Ukraine to the American people. Biden is not a great speaker, but you know, his people could write him a good speech. If he's willing to give it, his people need to write a good speech. He needs to keep telling us over and over again why this war matters. You know, he doesn't do that. And I think you let the Republicans or I should not the Republicans, the MAGA Republicans, because it's not. Although, let me just say, um, unfortunately, DeSantis did it today, too. DeSantis is the Florida governor Republican who is one of the top candidates on the Republican side to run for president next time. We believe he hasn't announced, but he clearly wants to be president. And he was critical of Ukraine today, too. Um, and it, it it's it's. Not good. I mean, it's very dangerous what's happening there. Um, Biden needs to do a much better job responding to this stuff. He needs to explain. And frankly, the thing is, the thing that gets me is Democrats should love this stuff. The fact that Republicans are basically soft, on, again, not all Republicans, I know that, right? But I'm saying, like, if you're looking, DeSantis, Trump versus Biden versus Fox News, right? The fact that Republicans, meaning Fox News, uh, Trump, DeSantis, the fact that they're soft on freedom, the fact that they're soft on the military, right? The fact that they are now openly critical of the FBI and all that kind of stuff, right? They hate the CIA. They hate the FBI. They don't like our military. They, they, they don't want us defending freedom abroad. Those are just traditional Republican values. I mean, those are things that most Republicans kind of go, eh, I don't know about that, right? Americans don't, probably like you guys in the rest of the world, Americans don't want you know, they don't want to be involved in every war. If they're going to be involved in a war, they want to tell you why. And frankly, Afghanistan and Iraq, not very good. I mean, Afghanistan, I mean, we had Osama bin Laden. There wasn't a choice there, right? Didn't turn out well, but I understand why we got involved. Iraq was a lie. The first Iraq war was justified. We saved Kuwait. You're welcome, Kuwait. Kuwait doesn't care anymore, but, you know, you're welcome. Um, and Saudi Arabia, you're welcome. They don't care. The second Iraq war was a lie. You know, that was that was wrong. We shouldn't have gotten in that war. But the American people, this goes back to the Reagan thing. The whole issue of, of defending freedom and spread, spreading freedom, freedom abroad still resonates with Americans. We are the biggest democracy. We are the biggest military power at the moment. We're the only superpower in, in all areas, you know, economic, cultural, military, et cetera, at the moment. American people like that. I mean, it's something that drives the rest of you crazy sometimes, but it's something that Americans take pride in. You know, you know that whole America's number one and that kind of stuff. But, but you know, use that. I, I, this is my marketing idea. Use that bias. Use the fact that Americans think they're the best country in the world, and and use it to say we are uniquely placed to help the world. We are uniquely placed to help spread and defend freedom. You know. Yeah, you don't want more war. That's it, but that's easy to answer too. Somebody on TikTok saying we don't want we don't want more war. I don't want more war either. We've got a war. We've got a war. 
You should have told the Russians that a year ago because Russia invaded a European country. They tried to commit genocide. They wanted to get rid of 43 million people. And then next, they would attack a NATO country, which means we would have war. But they'd be stronger after they took over Ukraine to do it. So you don't want war. I don't want war either. We've already got a war. So the question is, are you going to sit back and let that war get worse? Or are you going to do something about it and defend people who are literally facing genocide in Europe? Because anybody who's a student of history knows what happens with genocide in Europe. It doesn't end well. And frankly, it doesn't end well when America sits it out because we don't want war. That's what we did in World War II. We were tired of World War I. Thank you, big girl, for that. We retired after World War I, and we didn't want to fight. Well, see, the neat thing is, Christina, are you going to fight? Christina, here's the neat thing. None of us have to fight. That's the beauty of it. We send our money. We send our weapons. And the Ukrainians are, have been amazing that they are willing to defend their own country if we would only help them. That's the best part of it. I mean, that's but because you're exactly right. I don't want to fight. I don't want my, my nephews fighting. I don't want your kids fighting. That's why we should be helping Ukraine to ensure that we don't have to fight over there, right? Right? I mean, we're helping to, to, to use, I don't know if it was World War II or what was the, the, the saying, but you know, we're helping them over there so we don't, so that we're, we're helping them fight over there so we don't have to fight over here. But again, we need to explain this and we've got to explain it all the time. We've got to explain it all the time, you know? No, I mean, because those, that's why I'm saying, like, I'm happy to respond to some of those comments because those are the comments that are used. But Biden is not, and Biden's, it's got to be Biden, but also find some other, maybe it's Obama, maybe it's Bill Clinton. You know, Bill Clinton's gotten a bad rap. I mean, Bill Clinton is, is good at this stuff. Get people who are able to explain, thank you, Tattooed, and who was the hands from? Betty, thank you, Betty. Get people who can explain this. And frankly, get some Republicans who can explain this well, you know? I mean, Mitch McConnell isn't the best speaker, but McConnell is very strong on this stuff. Part of the deal should be McConnell and Republicans. You need to get out there and say this too, because unfortunately we live in a world now where simply because Joe Biden supports the war, there's an element of the Republican party. Thank you, Jetta. Tends to be MAGA Republicans and Fox News Republicans who think because Biden supports the war, we have to oppose the war. Come on, you know? I mean, why don't you look at it as on a rare issue, Biden actually agrees with Republicans that we, that America do, is a beacon for democracy and that America should go and, and help our allies around the world when, when, when it's important, right? I mean, how hard is it to differentiate Afghanistan and Iraq to, to Ukraine? Ukraine, we've got a reason to be there. Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, right? B. Smith, what are your thoughts on Turkey op Turkey opening up to talks for Sweden to go into NATO? Yeah, I saw. Uh, wait, I did not see that with Sweden. I didn't see anything with that with Sweden. Was there something new today? The last time I saw this was yesterday or the day before, and I saw that basically Turkey was forcing. Um, you know, thank you, Rhonda, for that. Turkey was pretty much forcing uh, uh, Finland to go it alone. And saying, well, we're happy to vote on Finland, but Sweden, we're not going to vote. So did something happen that somehow opened it up again? That, I mean, meaning Turkey showed a little, a little move or something with regards to NATO? I don't know. I mean, not NATO. With regards to uh, Sweden and NATO? Um, I don't know. Um, beep, 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 beep. We'll do a couple more, guys. And then, sorry, 723, but what the heck. A couple more, and then we'll go. Um, Beep, beep, beep. Talking with Sweden. Well, that's good. That's good. Talking is good. Yeah, Seymour Hirsch. Blah. Boring. Boring. Privit Zukraini. Privit Washington. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, we've talked about the Seymour Hirsch thing. You know, he's one guy. Talk to one guy. And his, uh, they fact checked his. Seymour Hirsch is this American journalist, but he's kind of thrown himself in with the crazies that th he talked to one guy who told him the Americans blew up the pipeline and a lot of other journalists have investigated and not only can't find anything to back up what Hirsch is saying, but a lot of what he's saying just doesn't make sense. I mean, I point it to this way and yeah, we'll do the recap in a second. I put it this way. Joe Biden 
has basically been terrified of Vladimir Putin for a year. So terrified of Vladimir Putin that Biden keeps refusing to give Ukraine the weapons that it needs. He gives Ukraine a lot. Don't get me wrong. He gives Ukraine a lot of money and a lot of weapons. But it, but from the beginning, it's never been quite what they need, right? Slowly, 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 we took forever for the HIMARS. Not forever. We took months for the HIMARS, and then it was only a couple of HIMARS. We took forever until we were sending them uh, Patriot missiles. That was only a few weeks ago or a few months ago. We took forever until we were going to send them tanks. That was just a couple of weeks ago. Fighter jets. We're still not going to give them some, send them fighter jets. We're still not going to send them long-range weapons, long-range missiles. So Joe Biden who is just ridiculously afraid, in my view, of Vladimir Putin, tur today still, turned around six months ago and said, hey, let's bomb a Russian pipeline that's underwater near Norway. It's an act of war. This would literally be declaring war on Russia, and they might just attack us if we do this, and they're a nuclear power, but let's do it anyway. And Let's involve Norway in it so that our secret can get out to another country entirely. So it increases the risk of other countries finding out, right? So Joe Biden, who won't even give Ukraine long range missiles because he's so freaked out or Poland, bingo, Timothy Lear is saying Polish MiGs. Joe Biden, who wouldn't even work the deal to give Ukraine Polish MiG fighter jets is sitting here saying, sure, I'll declare war on Russia by blowing up their pipeline. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. That's not Biden. And in any case, the story has de been debunked a lot now. I just don't believe it. I don't believe it. Um, because again, it's not Biden. I mean, anyway. All right, guys, let me do a wrap up because <clears throat> it's already almost 730. We've been going for an hour and a half, which is great. Um, I do agree with the boiling frog analogy. In this case, I would say the boiling frog analogy, someone's asking on TikTok, the boiling frog analogy is, I don't know that it's true, but you know, if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it'll jump out. If you put a frog in a pot of cold water and turn the heat on very, very gently, the pot will slowly heat up to the point where the frog will never know and it, it'll get boiled. Probably not true. My guess is like you and me, like if you get into a bathtub, once the bathtub gets too hot, you get out. But nonetheless, the idea is going very slowly with this stuff. I think we've been treating Ukraine as the frog in the We're slowing things up in Ukraine, slowly, slowly, slowly giving better. And I think we needed to do it a lot more quickly because this stuff is going on forever. This stuff is, is taking too long. And we run the risk of the American people saying, this war is going on too long. We've spent too much money when we still haven't given Ukraine the weapons that it really needs. Right? So... All right, let me do the quick summary, guys, and then we are done. I'm not going to go to Discord tonight because we have been doing this for an hour and a half. Um, but you can check out my Discord. Like I said, discord.erevosis.com. Um, all my links, the Patreon. Um, oh, the Discord is where we've got the, the Zelensky sweatshirts for auction, among other, th among other th cool things. So you can check that out over there. Um, let me do the quick recap of the issues we covered tonight, and then we are off. Uh, President Biden was in Kiev today. Um, the I'm just looking here. Russian military bloggers say it was an embarrassment for Putin because uh, the Biden administration called Putin to let him know that, that Biden was coming, so not to shoot him, and that this means Putin gave Biden permission. Um, I said it, I thought this was very important symbolically. I didn't. I was sort of talking off the cuff, but from my notes. Um, sending an important message to other European leaders that America is still supporting Ukraine in this, sending the message to the Ukrainians and sending the message to the Russians. Um, again, just trying to give you the, the, the summary here. Um, I feel that this is a sign that Biden is now moving, moving closer and closer to supporting Ukraine winning the war and not just Ukraine not losing the war. Um, so that's good. Biden is now in Poland and will speak tomorrow and Putin himself is talking tomorrow. So that's going to be interesting to have both presidents giving a major address tomorrow about the war. Um, dee, 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 dee. Italian Prime Minister Georgia Maloney was in Kiev today. Poor timing on her part because nobody knows that she was in Kiev today because they're all focusing on Biden. Uh, regarding the state of the war, I went through a lot on this, but overall, a lot of the defense analysts think that this Russian offensive that is in part already happening, isn't going to amount to much because Russia doesn't have, an, they still don't have enough troops. Um, the troops they've got are still not trained well enough. They don't have the right equipment. They don't have enough equipment. And Russia has too many fronts in the war. So a lot of the military folks think 
this may not make much of a difference. You know, Russia's big offensive that we've all been worried about. Um, tanks, I didn't mention this. Ukrainian forces, uh, this is from Institute for the Study of War. Ukrainian forces will reportedly be able to deploy only 50 Western provided tanks to frontline areas by April out of a promised total of 320. 50 of 320. And this is why I get so upset about us dragging our feet and not helping the Ukrainians earlier. Because we sit there and we say, we'll send you, after, after a year of saying, we're not going to send you tanks, we finally say, we'll send you tanks. But in America's case, it might take a year for us to get you those tanks. In the German case, Germany's going to provide some tanks, but doesn't have all of them. The European countries that were going to join Germany in sending tanks, a lot of them are now backing out. I mean, it's blip, 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 right? Had we, had we had this fight six months ago, had we had the fight over tanks, and had we at least decided to send the tanks, we would have had these past six months to figure out all of these problems. Whereas now, we're still trying to figure out the problems of who gets to send tanks, who's going to fix them, all this kind of crap. Just pisses me off. Um, Italy says it's open to sending fighter jets to Ukraine after everybody else does. Thanks, Italy. Um, Navalny, this was interesting. The Russian opposition leader today urged the restoration of Ukraine's 1991 borders and reparation payments by Russia to Ukraine. That's a big deal. Uh, and then finally, oh no, two, two final stories. China, uh, Oh, yeah. UN ambassador from the United States, Linda Thomas Greenfield, said that it would be a red line if China provided lethal aid to Russia. And finally, Prigozhin, who's the Russian oligarch, a billionaire who runs the Wagner mercenary group, uh, according to Reuters today, said, this was great, that the Russian Ministry of Defense has basically cut off the Wagner Group mercenaries in eastern, in eastern Ukraine, and they're no longer giving them ammunition. <laughs> because they're pissed at them. And he's pissed now because he's like, my men are going to die. And I brought up the story because it's a, a thank you, Me95. It's a wonderful example of the Russians not getting along very well with each other, their own troops. And this kind of infighting is great because it only helps Ukraine. So there you go, guys. That was a long one tonight, but this was a special show because of the Biden news was obviously a big deal. Um, Okay, sending the mods are trying to get us to 200,000 likes on TikTok. I think we're almost there, 195. We'll make it by the time I'm done. Um, but thank you all for joining. Tomorrow, uh, I will be back, 6 p.m. Eastern Time U.S. Um, I am always back every night, Monday to Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. New York City Time. Put it in your calendars. You will find me here, TikTok, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. That's it. That's all of them. And um, otherwise, I will, I'm not going to go to Discord tonight just because I'm, you know, been doing this for an hour and a half, but tomorrow we'll do a Discord as well. So I usually do a hangout on Discord after, not usually, but a lot of times do I hang out on Discord. So thank you guys for all the gifts. I really appreciate it. Thank you, moderators, for patrolling the trolls tonight. Looked especially fun on TikTok, especially with all the, the, the thumpers. Um, and uh, there you go. So I will see you guys tomorrow and um, just thank you. And like I said, remember, you can go to aerovosis.com or the link in my uh, TikTok profile to find all my stuff, my Patreon, my Discord, my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, if you want to see who I am, all that kind of stuff. All right, guys. Woo -woo! And remember, Discord, you can auction. I've got Zelensky sweatshirts, the actual sweatshirts Zelensky wears. So feel free to go bid. All right, guys, have a very good night. I will see you all tomorrow. 213,000. There we go. Thank you, guys. Thank you, TikTokers, for the, for the, what do you call them? Taps? I never know what we call them. The likes. The likes on TikTok. All right. See you guys. This was good tonight. Yeah. All right.